this is going to be a quick video, hopefully one of a small series, uh, detailing my attempts to make a uh, vacuum tube based AM transmitter. Um, playing music of your own choice over an AM radio is one of the best ways to play any kind of music over a vintage set because there's usually not much in the way of music on the, on the broadcast band these days and if there is it's probably not something you particularly want to listen to. I, I like 70s and 80s rock and pop and synth and all that kind of crap and well you're not going to find that on AM. Most of it's just talk shows or uh, political junk. So your options are to either uh, put in an auxiliary input to a set if it's capable of that. I've done that a few times or you can buy ready-made uh, modern um, transistor-based transmitters. But those generally aren't cheap. You're going to pay upwards of a hundred bucks for a good one. And uh, then of course there's a large contingent of people in the hobby that really like to experiment with building their own transmitters. That's something that radio enthusiasts have done for decades since radio first really became mainstream. And I, I've always wanted to build a transmitter. I've, I've built transmitters before with the 555 timer you know, a very basic one and using a transformer as a modulation, kind of like plate modulation actually. And they were okay. Power output was pretty weak. You had to sit it right next to the radio for it to work. And most of the one tube AM transmitter kits you can get, like the, AE, or the uh, antique electronic supply kit that uses a 12SA7, generally have very poor distance. I mean, even with like a, a few feet worth of antenna, I, people usually have to set them right next to the radio they want stuff to play over and even then the audio quality isn't always perfect. Uh, so I wanted to try building my own using whatever I had on hand. I wanted to avoid buying as much as I could. So I was lucky in that I had most of a junk uh, uh, late 40s AM FM set that just flat out didn't work. I tried everything I could to get the thing to work and I ended up just salvaging all the good parts out of it, sockets, the power transformer, uh, all that junk, but more importantly to the things that I really needed to get this to work or to get any transmitter to work was the tuning condenser and flip this over here, the uh, oscillator coil. Now you can make transmitters, a lot of the guys that use a, a transmitter, they use them with, with a crystal so you have a nice stable uh, uh, source for modulation. So my transmitter is a two tube unit and it's split up into two halves. You have the uh, oscillator section here which uses a 6J5 triode and the uh, tank circuit is our variable uh, tuning capacitor here and the uh, oscillator coil at the back here uh, that I robbed from the same set. Now I've got this little switch on the side here that allows me to flip between two of the, uh, the uh, tuning condenser sections so that I can vary what parts of the band I want. This section here will actually get me from about a um, uh, thousand kilohertz uh, up beyond 1600 kilohertz and this one over here was originally part of the oscillator circuit for the AM band so it'll go relatively low maybe six or seven hundred kilohertz and then up over 1600, but I seem to have more luck with this side than with this side, and the dial is pretty crowded at the upper end, and my audio quality at the lower end is pretty bad. So I tend to use this section, and I leave it at about 1,000 kilohertz, or a little over 1,000, because there's a, a, a fairly good dead spot there on the band. So we've got the oscillator section, and this is this, I'm using this uh, goat shield that's technically for a uh, a G style tube, uh, but I've got a standard GT style hidden under there. I'm going to go back and uh, pick up a regular, a metal type, the original 6J5. They've got a few of those with good filaments so uh, that it's properly shielded and I'm not wasting a good goat shield. But the, uh, the oscillator section, we've got that covered. The uh, oscillator's timing components these guys are then uh, bypassed through these capacitors here and we have the uh, grid leak resistors those are both 47 kilo ohms. I played with those a little bit to see if I can uh, adjust the output a little bit there about where I want them to be in terms of the output uh, quality. I think it's about 2 volts peak to peak grid output 
from this 47 pico farad capacitor here. I originally had trouble getting the oscillator to run uh, at low frequencies with the 47 pico I was using because that's uh, what the mixer circuits in the old old uh, diagrams used to show but I upped it to about 240 picofarads based on some other online designs I saw and that fixed that problem and now I can get the oscillator to run at lower frequencies it just doesn't have as good have as good an output uh, and the in order to couple the uh, oscillator stage to the uh, the mixer I've got a shielded length of wire here with this sort of spring coil wrapped around it that is then connected to the ground on the socket. So we got a 6J5 oscillator and I'm using a 6A8 because they're relatively common as the mixer. I could have used a 6SA7 but I like tubes that have great caps just because they look neat and uh, it gave me an excuse to pick up some extra 6A8s. I've got some other sets that use them. But the 6A8 here, the, uh, the grid cap is actually our audio input so I've got a, a stereo jack here tying the two stereo legs together with one kilo ohm load resistors uh, to to bring those together to a mono input, feeding that to the grid cap, and then we have the entirety of the power supply circuit over here. So this design isn't perfect in that I didn't have a good transformer that could do both filament voltage and plate voltage. And you don't need a lot of plate voltage. I think I have 134 volts DC, maybe. Um, a lot of the people I've seen use a one-to-one, -one, basically just an isolation transformer. So you take the 120 AC, uh, you use a single diode here, the 1 and 4007, got a Pi filter with two 33 microfarad capacitors and a 2.2 kilo ohm resistor in between them. That charges up to unloaded, about 170 volts, but under load from these two tubes it drops to about 134, 135. I've played with that a little bit. And while they do offer transformers, I wanted to use parts that I had, and I have no transformers with a high voltage output or even an isolated output, at least not any ones that I'd want to sacrifice for a cheap project like this. But I did have this $1 filament transformer that I picked up in a, a, a warehouse, and it had a 6.3 volt filament winding on the secondary, so I figured that I would just use a polarized cord and the, power, the, the rectified power supply for the plate is right off of the line. So you've got 120 volts AC coming in through the power switch, going through a fuse block, and that's fed directly into the transformer for filament voltage. I've got a one ohm dropping resistor on there because uh, this transformer was originally designed for 115 and at 120, 125. It outputs closer to 7 volts, it says 6.3, so at the uh, 6 tenths of an amp these tubes are consuming that one ohm resistor drops enough current, uh, drops enough voltage to operate them at a safe level. And uh, yeah, so the primary of the transformer then splits off and you've got 120 volts coming into here being rectified and charging up those two capacitors that provides the plate supply for these two guys here and also the uh, the screen screen and um, tri or oscillator anode connections are passed through dropping resistors. I haven't really gotten those figured out yet. I'm none too familiar with the effects of increasing or decreasing uh, the voltage on those particular elements. I have a, uh, a box that allows me to sub in different values and I was going to play with that a little bit to see how that alters the uh, output. But right now uh, with this thing set up at uh, when just about any frequency actually, I'm getting a good range of at least 13 to 14 feet in every direction. I haven't tested it, I, actually no, I take it back, I have tested it through walls. The uh, room opposite me, I can pick it up, but I'm going to retest that on a tube radio. Um, the only thing I seem to be having a problem with is there is a rather obnoxious high-pitched whistle in the background when this is tuned to on a set. Um, I'm not sure if that's from heterodyning with a local frequency as even in the dead spots there are still remnants of stations uh, coming in that I am trying to override with the signal from this transmitter and that doesn't always work that great. And the other thing is the ground in all of this is connected to the neutral side of the power socket and there's always the chance that noise can get in from that. And I mean I've 
I've got a, an X-type uh, filled, uh, capa- safety cap over the uh, power connections, but at the end of the day, what I really need is a proper isolated power supply with good bypass caps to get into a true ground and uh, you know a full wave rectifier and all that good stuff. So if this works out okay, I'd like to redesign a new one that uses a full wave rectifier and instead of using this modulation setup, I still want to go with a separate oscillator and all that stuff because it helps to separate everything out and go with a separate oscillator and then have a rectifier oscillator, uh, an audio preamp, a power output tube that actually drives the antenna output like a 6L6. I'd really like to build a 6L6 based one so I can get some of those pretty cheap and then have a um, basically do plate modulation with a transformer rather than using uh, a grid modulation like I'm doing on this thing because the 688 is designed to be um, a it, it's a uh, I care it's a pentagrid mixer it the, the, the 688 is intended to do the work of both the uh, the mixer tube in an AM radio and the oscillator tube which is why it has an extra grid and effectively an extra anode connection so that you could hook this oscillator coil and tuning capacitor directly into those connections instead of having a separated unit. But I like having it this way because it means that I can tune this one section of the circuit so I then know that it works all the time and then I can set that up. And uh, oh, I wanted to do, I did want to note that the oscillator setup for this is uh, through the plate rather than through the cathode for the feedback setup. I just had better luck with that. And uh, what really helped this thing work was the use of a radio frequency choke in the plate supply of the 6A8. Uh, I don't fully understand um, how you're supposed to, to build AM transmitters and all that stuff, but my guess is this choke actually uh, keeps the radio frequency, the uh, the uh, the fact that the anode is drawing current that is rapidly changing, this choke here keeps that from showing up in the plate supply for everything else. So the 6J5 will hopefully not see those uh, fluctuations. Uh, it also it greatly improved my, uh, my uh, distance, actually. I've got an antenna terminal back here, and when I was doing testing, in order to get any kind of meaningful signal, I had to lay the antenna right next to the radio to get it to pick the station up at any good amount. But with the RFC placed in there, I think it's 2.5 millihenries, and just a, like a two or three feet of antenna, I actually have a toilet paper tube with some wire wrapped around it hooked up to this thing. Super easy to get a nice broadcast distance. Audio quality is listenable enough to be enjoyable at uh, moderate to uh, moderate volume or so. You're not going to pick it up super low on an AA5, but I haven't had any time to test it with anything else. And overall, I'm pretty happy with this is the way this has turned out. I'm hoping to demonstrate it in a lab at some point just to show some of the other other nerds what I've been working on. That's all for now on this.